Section 20 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Section 20. The 415 Express, Part 3. He came, a small, slight, sandy-haired, keen-eyed man, with an eager, nervous manner, and a forest of light beard and mustache. He just showed himself at the door of the boardroom, and being requested to bring a certain day-book from a certain shelf in a certain room, bowed and vanished. He was there such a moment, and the surprise of seeing him was so great and sudden, that it was not till the door had closed upon him that I found voice to speak. He was no sooner gone, however, than I sprang to my feet. "'That person,' I said, "'is the same who met Mr. Dwerry House upon the platform at Blackwater.' There was a general movement of surprise. The chairman looked grave and somewhat agitated. "'Take care, Mr. Langford,' he said. "'Take care what you say.' I am as positive of his identity as of my own. Do you consider the consequences of your words? Do you consider that you are bringing a charge of the gravest character against one of the company's servants? I am willing to be put upon my oath if necessary. The man who came to that door a minute since is the same whom I saw talking with Mr. Dwerry House on the Blackwater platform. Were he twenty times the company's servant, I could say neither more nor less. The chairman turned again to the guard. Did you see Mr. Rakes in the train or on the platform? he asked. Summers shook his head. I am confident Mr. Rakes was not in the train, he said, and I certainly did not see him on the platform. The chairman turned next to the secretary. Mr. Rakes is in your office, Mr. Hunter, he said. Can you remember if he was absent on the fourth instant? I do not think he was replied the secretary, but I am not prepared to speak positively. I have been away most afternoons myself lately, and Mr. Rakes might easily have absented himself if he had been disposed. At this moment the under-secretary returned with the day-book under his arm. "'Be pleased to refer, Mr. Rakes,' said the chairman, to the entries of the fourth instant, and see what Benjamin Summers' duties were on that day. Mr. Rakes threw open the cumbrous volume, and ran a practiced eye and finger down some three or four successive columns of entries. Stopping suddenly at the foot of a page, he then read aloud that Benjamin Summers had on that day conducted the 4.15 Express from London to Crampton. The chairman leaned forward in his seat, looked the under-secretary full in the face, and said quite sharply and suddenly, "'And where were you, Mr. Rakes, on the same afternoon?' "'I, sir?' "'You, Mr. Rakes.' Where were you on the afternoon and evening of the fourth of the present month? Here, sir, in Mr. Hunter's office. Where else should I be? There was a dash of trepidation in the under-secretary's voice as he said this, but his look of surprise was natural enough. We have some reason for believing, Mr. Rakes, that you were absent that afternoon without leave. Was this the case? Certainly not, sir. I have not had a day's holiday since September. Mr. Hunter will bear me out in this. Mr. Hunter repeated what he had previously said on the subject, but added that the clerks in the adjoining office would be certain to know. 
whereupon the senior clerk, a grave, middle-aged person in green glasses, was summoned and interrogated. His testimony cleared the undersecretary at once. He declared that Mr. Rakes had in no instance, to his knowledge, been absent during office hours since his return from his annual holiday in September. I was confounded. The chairman turned to me with a smile, in which a shade of covert annoyance was scarcely apparent. "'You hear, Mr. Langford?' he said. "'I hear, sir, but my conviction remains unshaken.' "'I fear, Mr. Langford, that your convictions are very insufficiently based,' replied the chairman with a doubtful cough. "'I fear that you dream dreams and mistake them for actual occurrences.' It is a dangerous habit of mind, and might lead to dangerous results. Mr. Rakes here would have found himself in an unpleasant position had he not proved so satisfactory an alibi. I was about to reply, but he gave me no time. I think, gentlemen, he went on to say, addressing the board, that we should be wasting time to push this inquiry further. Mr. Langford's evidence would seem to be of an equal value throughout. The testimony of Benjamin Summers disproves his first statement, and the testimony of the last witness disproves the second. I think we may conclude that Mr. Langford fell asleep in the train on the occasion of his journey to Clayborough, and dreamed an unusually vivid and circumstantial dream of which, however, we have now heard quite enough. There are few things more annoying than to find one's positive convictions met with incredulity. I could not help feeling impatient at the turn that affairs had taken. I was not proof against the civil sarcasm of the chairman's manner. Most intolerable of all, however, was the quiet smile lurking about the corners of Benjamin Summers' mouth, and the half-triumphant, half-malicious gleam in the eyes of the undersecretary. The man was evidently puzzled and somewhat alarmed. His look seemed furtively to interrogate me. Who was I? What did I want? Why had I come there to do him an ill turn with his employers? What was it to me whether or no he was absent without leave? Seeing all this, and perhaps irritated by it more than the thing deserved, I begged leave to detain the attention of the board for a moment longer. Jelf plucked me impatiently by the sleeve. "'Better let the thing drop,' he whispered. "'The chairman's right enough. You dreamed it. And the less said now, the better.' I was not to be silenced, however, in this fashion. I had yet something to say, and I would say it. It was to this effect— that dreams were not usually productive of tangible results, and that I requested to know in what way the chairman conceived I had evolved from my dream so substantial and well made a delusion as the cigar case which I had had the honor to place before him at the commencement of our interview. The cigar case, I admit, Mr. Langford, the chairman replied is a very strong point in your evidence. It is your only strong point, however, and there is just a possibility that we may all be misled by a mere accidental resemblance. Will you permit me to see the case again? It is unlikely, I said, as I handed it to him, any other should bear precisely this monogram, and yet be in all other particulars exactly similar. 
the chairman examined it for a moment in silence and then passed it on to mr hunter mr hunter turned it over and over and shook his head this is no mere resemblance he said it is john dwerryhouse's cigar case to a certainty i remember it perfectly i have seen it a hundred times i believe i may say the same added the chairman yet how account for the way in which mr langford asserts that it came into his possession i can only repeat i replied that i found it on the floor of the carriage after mr dwerry house had alighted it was in leaning out to look after him that i trod upon it and it was in running after him for the purpose of restoring it that i saw or believed i saw mr rakes standing beside with him in earnest conversation again i felt jonathan jelf plucking at my sleeve look at rakes he whispered look at rakes i turned to where the under secretary had been standing a moment before and saw him white as death with lips trembling and livid stealing toward the door to conceive a sudden strange and indefinite suspicion to fling myself in his way to take him by the shoulders as if he were a child and turn his craven face perforce toward the board were with me the work of an instant look at him i exclaimed look at his face i ask no better witness to the truth of my words the chairman's brow darkened mr rakes he said sternly if you know anything you had better speak vainly trying to wrench himself from my grasp the under-secretary stammered out in incoherent denial let me go he said I, I know nothing you have no right to detain me let me go did you or did you not meet mr john dwerry house at blackwater station the charge brought against you is either true or false if true you will do well to throw yourself upon the mercy of the board and make full confession of all that you know the under-secretary wrung his hands in an agony of helpless terror i was away he cried i was two hundred miles away at the time i know nothing about it i have nothing to confess i am innocent i call god to witness i am innocent two hundred miles away echoed the chairman what do you mean i was in devonshire i had three weeks leave of absence i appealed to mr hunter mr hunter knows i had three weeks leave of absence i was in devonshire all the time i can prove i was in devonshire seeing him so abject so incoherent so wild with apprehension the directors began to whisper gravely among themselves while one got quietly up and called the porter to guard the door what has your being in devonshire to do with the matter said the chairman when were you in devonshire mr rakes took his leave in september said the secretary about the time when mr dwerry house disappeared i never even heard that he had disappeared till i came back that must remain to be proved said the chairman i shall at once put this matter in the hands of the police in the meanwhile mr rakes being myself a magistrate and used to deal with these cases i advise you to offer no resistance but to confess while confession may yet do you service as for your accomplice 
the frightened wretch fell upon his knees. I had no accomplice, he cried. Only have mercy upon me. Only spare my life, and I will confess all. I didn't mean to harm him. I didn't mean to hurt a hair on his head. Only have mercy on me and let me go. The chairman rose in his place, pale and agitated. Good heavens, he exclaimed. What horrible mystery is this? What does it mean? As sure as there is a God in heaven, said Jonathan Jelf, it means that murder has been done. No, 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 shrieked Rakes, still upon his knees and cowering like a beaten hound. Not murder. No jury that ever sat could bring it in murder. I thought I had only stunned him. I never meant to do more than stun him. Manslaughter, manslaughter, not murder. Overcome by the horror of this unexpected revelation, the chairman covered his face with his hand and for a moment or two remained silent. Miserable man, he said at length, you have betrayed yourself. You bade me confess. You urged me to throw myself upon the mercy of the board. You have confessed to a crime which no one suspected you of having committed, replied the chairman, and which this board has no power either to punish or forgive. All that I can do for you is to advise you to submit to the law to plead guilty, and to conceal nothing. When did you do this deed? The guilty man rose to his feet and leaned heavily against the table. His answer came reluctantly, like the speech of one dreaming. On the 22nd of September. On the 22nd of September? I looked in Jonathan Jelf's face, and he in mine. I felt my own paling with a strange sense of wonder and dread. I saw him blanch suddenly, even to the lips. "'Merciful heaven!' he whispered. "'What was it, then, that you saw in the train?' "'What was it that I saw in the train?' That question remains unanswered to this day. I have never been able to reply to it. I only know that it bore the living likeness of the murdered man, whose body had then been lying some ten weeks under a rough pile of branches and brambles and rotting leaves at the bottom of a deserted chalk pit about halfway between Blackwater and Mallingford. I know that it spoke and moved and looked as that man spoke and moved and looked in life, that I heard, or seemed to hear, things related which I could never otherwise have learned, that I was guided, as it were, by that vision on the platform to the identification of the murderer, and that, a passive instrument myself, I was destined by means of these mysterious teachings to bring about the ends of justice. For these things I have never been able to account. As for that matter of the cigar case, it proved on inquiry that the carriage in which I travelled down that afternoon to Clayborough had not been in use for several weeks and was, in point of fact, the same in which poor John Dwerry House had performed his last journey. The case had doubtless been dropped by him, and had lain unnoticed till I found it. Upon the details of the murder I have no need to dwell. Those who desire more ample particulars may find them, and the written confession of Augustus Rakes in the files of the Times for 1856. 
enough that the undersecretary, knowing the history of the new line, and following the negotiation step by step through all its stages, determined to waylay Mr. Dwerry House, rob him of the seventy-five thousand pounds, and escape to America with his booty. In order to effect these ends, he obtained leave of absence a few days before the time appointed for the payment of the money, secured his passage across the Atlantic in a steamer advertised to start on the 23rd, provided himself with a heavily loaded life preserver, and went down to Blackwater to await the arrival of his victim. How he met him on the platform with a pretended message from the board, how he offered to conduct him by a short cut across the fields to Mallingford, how, having brought him to a lonely place, he struck him down with the life preserver and so killed him, and how, finding what he had done, he dragged the body to the verge of an out of the way chalk pit and there flung it in and piled it over with branches and brambles, the facts still fresh in the memories of those who, like the connoisseurs in De Quincey's famous essay, regard murder as a fine art. Strangely enough, the murderer, having done his work, was afraid to leave the country. He declared that he had not intended to take the director's life, but only to stun and rob him, and that, finding the blow had killed, he dared not fly for fear of drawing down suspicion upon his own head. As a mere robber, he would have been safe in the States, but as a murderer, he would inevitably have been pursued and given up to justice so he forfeited his passage returned to the office as usual at the end of his leave and locked up his ill-gotten thousands till a more convenient opportunity in the meanwhile he had the satisfaction of finding that mr dwerry house was universally believed to have absconded with the money no one knew how or whither whether he meant murder or not, however, Mr. Augustus Rakes paid the full penalty of his crime, and was hanged at the Old Bailey in the second week of January, 1857. Those who desire to make his further acquaintance may see him any day, admirably done in wax, in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussaud's exhibition in Baker Street he is there to be found in the midst of a select society of ladies and gentlemen of atrocious memory dressed in the close-cut tweed suit which he wore on the evening of the murder and holding in his hand the identical life preserver with which he committed it end of section twenty end of the 415 Express by Amelia B. Edwards. Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks so much.